Hi everyone, welcome to Synergy Flavors Trendcast episode 10. I'm Alex Matsumoto, I'm a marketing associate at Synergy Flavors in the US. And in this episode, we're bringing a topic that we're very passionate about here at Synergy, which is vanilla. So I'm joined by two great professionals that have been working with uh, vanilla for such a long time. So I'd like to thank and welcome Paulette Lenzoff, who is a consultant at Synergy and one of the greatest experts in the subject. And also Scott Mannion, our Associate Director of Procurement, that has also a long history working with Vanilla. Paulette, thanks for joining in. Um, can, could you tell us a little bit about you and your experience working with Vanilla? Sure, Alex. Thank you very much for um, giving me this opportunity. I, uh, my name is Paulette Lansoff. I have recently retired as Technical Director at Synergy, but I am continuing to consult. I have spent 43 plus years in this industry uh, learning about flavors um, and vanilla is one of my favorite flavors because it is the most exotic of flavors out there. Thanks, Paulette. Um, Scott, again, thanks for joining in uh, to be willing to share your expertise around vanilla with us. Thanks, Alex, for having me. My procurement history with vanilla started before my time at Synergy back in 2003. Where as a purchasing manager, I was responsible for the procurement of flavors and vanilla for a major CPG food company. At that time, I was buying pure vanilla extract and had only a limited understanding of the complexity around the purchase of the actual vanilla beans. I joined Synergy in 2017 and am responsible for working directly with the agents, preparers, and farmers on the ground in the Sava region of Madagascar. Vanilla is a fascinating and dynamic market, and Synergy has over 110 years of involvement in vanilla extraction. It's been extremely rewarding to be responsible for such an important category for this organization. Great. Um, all right, so let me start with Paulette. So Paulette, I think we all uh, that work in the food, beverage, and flavor industry have asked this question before, but um, what would you say that makes vanilla so unique? Um, it is a very exotic um, flavor profile with a wonderful rich history. It was first discovered by the indigenous people in um, Mexico growing wild in the jungles. They recognized the beautiful bouquet and flavor profile that vanilla imparted and kept it as a food for only the aristocracy and the gods. Uh, when Cortez came to Mexico in 1520, it was one of the gifts that the indigenous people supplied to him, and he brought it back to Spain. Once vanilla came to Europe, everyone fell in love with it, rightfully so, because the characteristic is just so interesting and so beautiful. But they could not get the product to grow anywhere outside of Mexico. Vanilla is the fruit of an orchid. Um, there's only three species of orchid that will produce fruit of the 500 plus species of orchids that are out there. Those are vanilla planifolia, tizensia, and pampanoa. Vanilla planifolia is the most predominant fruit that's used in commercial, but Tahitian and pampanoa are used in smaller quantities and grown. Vanilla is usually grown, the vanilla vines are grown on old forestation um, in the jungle or on plantations or sometimes in shade um, houses in various areas. The vines have to be propagated from cuttings. The vanilla seed is way too small for it to generate and to blossom into a, into a fruit or into a vine. The vines take uh, four to five years to mature once they are planted. Um, to produce the fruit that is necessary for cultivation and commercialization. One of the reasons that um, vanilla was only able, was not able to be propagated anywhere outside of Mexico early on was that there was a small bee that was able to get up into the flower and pollinate the orchid. That bee obviously was not native to anywhere else, um, and so the early attempts at growing vanilla were very frustrating. But in the late 1800s, a method of hand pollinating the vanilla orchid was developed. And that hand pollination is still what is used today. Uh, a vanilla vine is very prolific. There's usually about a thousand blossoms per vine. 
but not all of those can be pollinated or they will overtax the vine. The vanilla has to be hand pollinated within a five to six hour window of blooming before um, in order for it to come to fruition. Once um, pollinated, the beans take about three to four months to mature. They're very delicate, um, both the vine and the bean, so they require hand picking. One thing that's always very interesting about vanilla is because of the high cost of the beans, they're often branded in the field to prevent theft. So you can see there's a little bit of a, a pin prick that takes place and each farmer will brand their beans and that brand will stay with the bean as it's cured and dried. Once the beans are harvested, um, they need to be boiled to prevent the vegetative growth. So that begins the flavor pro development process. Um, this is still a very ancient practice. Um, the gentleman on the left in that picture has been working for a curator for three generations. Um, while uh, the temperature of the water is taken, this gentleman told us he preferred to use his elbow to determine when the water was at the right temperature because he had such a feel for it. So once the beans are um, boiled to stop that vegetative growth, they're then laid out on um, burlap bags in the field to sweat and to sun dry. And this process really helps the flavor to develop. This is where the precursors within the bean itself are turned into that flavor of vanilla. Um, they're allowed to bake for a short period of time and then they're wrapped up and allowed to sweat. So overnight, this these um, chemical reactions within the bean will take place and the flavor will develop. Um, this curing process um, is about two to three months total. Um, this is where all of that flavor development takes place. Uh, and the beans are then sorted according to size and quality. And they're wrapped into little bundles with um, a thread to hold them together. One of the trends we see developing um, in vanilla curing is a quick curing process where the green beans are chopped and then um, treated to accelerate the curing process. We've been rather disappointed in the flavor profile of those quick cure beans. While they do develop a fair amount of vanillin, the key component of uh, vanilla extract, they don't develop all the other rich, resinous, deep flavor profile that we expect to get in traditionally cured beans. Not only that, but the curing process does employ quite a number of people in Madagascar, and that can be the sole source of income for those people for the entire year, and quick curing would destroy those jobs. Currently, um, vanilla is 85% of the world's crop comes from Madagascar, and that is where the finest and best quality of vanilla comes from. We can also see commercial vanilla available from in Indonesia. In Indonesia, the characteristics of that extract are more smoky, more um, woody than the characteristics of the nice rummy characteristics we see in Madagascar vanilla. There's also a small amount of vanilla grown in Papua New Guinea and it has a different flavor profile. It is more floral and more um, uh, perfumey than the characteristic in Madagascar. Very little uh, commercial vanilla is grown in Mexico today um, and um, we do see some other regions that have been developing some horticulture in vanilla, including Uganda, um, some other regions in Central America and in India. From a sensory standpoint, um, how would you describe uh, vanilla? So vanilla has a very rich characteristic. Um, our friends in information technology tend to use the term vanilla when they're talking about something plain and, and simple. Vanilla is anything but that. It, as I said, it has very rich characteristics beyond just the um, signature compound of vanillin. There are 200 plus uh, compounds that are responsible for the overall flavor profile of vanilla. Um, vanilla has woody characteristics. There's smoky characteristics, um, rum-like notes. A vanilla can be floral and pruney. It can also have some off notes like a Play-Doh characteristic or a musty character. Um, and all of these characteristics have to be balanced correctly to get the right profile for vanilla to be delivered to the end user. 
Thanks, Paulette. That's that's really interesting. Um, Scott, let me turn now to you. Um, you also have years of experience in working with vanilla. Could you tell us a little bit about the market and the supply chain side of the vanilla business? Well, vanilla is a very unique supply chain and presents a number of challenges for companies like Synergy to both understand and manage. First, Madagascar produces around 80% of the world's vanilla. However, there's not acres and acres of neatly planted rows of vanilla vines like you'd expect to see for corn or wheat. Vanilla is grown in mountainous areas and is cultivated by local farmers who may produce a total harvest of several hundred pounds of vanilla beans. So there's thousands of farmers who bring their harvest to local villages. Some of these villages have organized into cooperatives to help manage the process of selling the harvest for the farmer. And all vanilla beans are sold on a cash basis. With the recent spike in vanilla bean prices, there have been times where selling has come to a halt while the government has needed to print more money in order to facilitate buying. Finally, the infrastructure to get the vanilla beans out of the mountains and into the hands of the preparers is also quite challenging. Roads in and out of these villages are unpaved, filled with deep ruts and at times very difficult to navigate if not unpassable. It can take several days to collect a single ton of vanilla beans. So with thousands of farmers, hundreds of villages and cooperatives to navigate, reliable on the ground relationships are essential to sourcing good quality beans, paying for them, and then transporting them for curing and preparation for export. There's another complication to the supply chain that is an ever-present risk in vanilla, and that's the weather. The island is susceptible to tropical storms and cyclones. Every spring, there is a real danger of a cyclone hitting the vanilla growing region and damaging the crop. Three years ago, Cyclone Iwano made a direct hit on the Sava region, where most of the island's vanilla is grown. The storm displaced tens of thousands of people and destroyed 40 to 50% of the vanilla crop. During this time, since the cyclone, quality has varied greatly, and it is through our relationships with our preparers that we've ensured the quality standards that we expect are met. After three relatively uneventful weather years, the crop is finally bouncing back to pre-cyclone quality and quantity levels. So here's how the market works. The Malagasy government sets the dates for when the new crop vanilla can begin trading and when cured beans can be exported out of the country. This is done as a sort of government imposed quality control. July 15th is typically the first date for the sale of green vanilla beans. Selling beans earlier can result in government confiscation. This is intended to discourage the farmers from picking their beans early. The longer vanilla is allowed to mature on the vine, the better the quality the cured vanilla will be. The green market typically lasts from mid-July to around the end of August. There's a second market called the rack market. This is for the sale of partially cured vanilla beans. The secondary market opens around September. If the farmer is unable to sell his beans in a green market, they can begin the curing process themselves and offer their vanilla on this secondary market. The period between July and November is typically the curing period where the vanilla is dried and prepared for export. The government also imposes a restriction on exports during the time the vanilla beans are growing and being cured. The goal here is to ensure the beans are not exported before curing can be completed. The first export date for the season is typically October 15th. So that's the basic structure of the vanilla market. Another dynamic to the supply chain 
is that the market is filled with multiple layers of middlemen. There's collectors, brokers, traders, and with the significant rise in vanilla prices, many speculators. All of these individuals represent layers between the farmer and the end user. These layers add both complexity and cost to the process of buying vanilla. So in recent years, farmers have begun working more closely and organizing as village cooperatives in an effort to cut out the speculators, work more closely with end users, and ultimately deliver more profits back to the farmers and the villages. This is clearly a more sustainable model for improving the prosperity of farmers who care for and nurture the vanilla vines, harvest the crop, and cure the vanilla beans. So to summarize, having those direct relationships and understanding these unique market dynamics are essential to sorting out the supply chain complexity and obtaining consistently high quality vanilla beans for our extraction. Cool. Um, Scott, I, I wanted to talk about um, a topic that it, it's a lot interesting for me and I'm sure for uh, for our audience as well. So you had the opportunity to visit some of our vanilla partners in Madagascar um, in 2018. Um, what, what was that experience like to you? Oh, it was a fantastic experience. I think the trip was vital from a procurement and ch supply chain perspective. To see the operation, know the people, understand the dynamics of the growing, harvesting, and processing. Being there and experiencing it was pretty incredible. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Seeing the passion and commitment of the people, the tradition to the work they do in the curing process, the pride they have in the vanilla they produce was very inspirational to see firsthand. We traveled to one village that has been a longtime provider of vanilla to our preparer. We met the village leader, toured his village, went up into the mountains to see the vanilla vines, interacted with the people. At the end of the day, we were invited into his home, where he said of all the years of growing vanilla, this was the first time he had ever met a partner who used his vanilla from America. Building those type of connections is very rewarding. Synergy believes strongly in giving back to the people of Madagascar as well. As part of our contribution and sustainability efforts, Synergy has worked since 2015 with the Madagascar Development Fund in the construction of eight schools for the children of the Saba region. These schools have helped more than 2,500 children. In our 2018 trip, we were fortunate enough to be guests of honor for the dedication of one of these schools. Synergy has continuing plans to support the construction of more schools and other projects that help improve the lives of the Malagasy people. According to the United Nations Development Program, school attendance in Madagascar is the third lowest in the world. We believe our efforts to support education in the vanilla growing region of Saba is one very important way we can give back to the people of Madagascar. Paulette, you have been in the industry for 40 plus years now. You are one of our vanilla experts, and I can imagine that going to Madagascar and be able to see where it all begins must be fascinating. Uh, what was that experience like to you? Oh, it was an amazing experience. Um, as much as I have studied vanilla to actually see the cultivation, to see the amount of labor that went into uh, curing those beans was eye-opening. Nothing prepared me for the sensory um, experience of smelling the vanilla, of the aroma of that curing vanilla in the field. But the best part of the experience was meeting the people of Madagascar and um, understanding their life and their happiness and their joy was just um, in spite of the poverty, in spite of um, the lack of the modern conveniences we take for granted. Um, watching these people and, and, you know, obviously communication was a little bit difficult, but everywhere we went, we were greeted by smiles and joy and 
people who were very proud of what they did and proud to show us their vanilla. My favorite experience was after we had done the dedication of the school and we were packing up um, the the um, van to um, go back to the hotel. There was a little boy about seven or eight years old watching us pack up and just happy smile on his face. And I happened to remember that I had a punching bag balloon in my knapsack and I pulled it out and I started to blow the balloon up. And the, the look on the this boy's face was just amazing. I guess I realized he'd never seen a balloon before um, because as it got bigger and bigger, so did his eyes. And when I tied it off and I showed him how to use the punching bag, um, he just, again, the greatest smile ever. And I, when I handed it to him, the joy on his face as he ran off to go show it to his friends was just amazing. And it was representative of how um, the lives of these people are being impacted by what we are giving back, um, but how they impact us with the simple joy that they feel in, um, in everyday life. Thanks for sharing that experience with us, Paulette. I think um, we can all benefit from stories like that. And to hear that from professionals that have lived that like you and Scott have, um, you know, is really amazing. Thanks for sharing. Um, that's a great way to wrap it up this episode. Um, as you can see, we have a long um, history and we're very passionate about vanilla here at Synergy. So if you have any questions or, or if you'd like to talk to us about vanilla, um, please reach out to us at SynergyTaste.com and keep an eye open for more episodes about vanilla like this one um, in this trendcast. Uh, once again, thank you, Paulette and Scott, for you know contributing this very rich topic. And I would like to thank you uh, for tuning in and listening to Synergy Flavors Trendcast. See you next time.